And this is something you probably won't have heard before. And it's a ghost story of sorts. It's set in Brighton, in England, in those little seaside towns where it's not Californian at all. <laughs> it's always gray and it's always wet. And the beaches aren't sand, they're hard pebbles. And it's called My Last Landlady. My last landlady, she was nothing like you, nothing at all alike. Her rooms were damp. The breakfasts were unpleasant. Oily eggs, leathery sausages, a baked orange sludge of beans. Her face could have curdled beans. She was not kind. You strike me as a kind person. I hope your world is kind. By which I mean, I've heard we see the world not as it is, but as we are. A saint sees a world of saints. A killer sees only murderers and victims. I see the dead. My landlady told me she would not willingly walk upon the beach, for it was littered with weapons, huge, hand-fitting rocks, each ripe for striking. She only had a little money in her tiny purse, she said, but they would take the notes, oily from her fingers, and leave the purse tucked underneath a stone. Or oh, in the water, she would say, hold anyone under, chill salt water, grey and brown, heavy as sin, all ready to drag you away. Children went like that so easily in the sea, when they were surplus to requirements, or had learned awkward facts they might be inclined to pass on to those who would listen. There were people on the West Pier the night it burned, she said. The curtains were dusty lace and blocked each town-grimed view. Sea view, that was a laugh. The morning she saw me twitch her curtains to see if it was properly raining, she rapped my knuckles. Mr. Maroney, she said, in this house we do not look at the sea through the windows. It brings bad luck. She said... People come to the beach to forget their problems. It's what we do, it's what the English do. You chop your girlfriend up because she's pregnant and you're worried what the wife would say if she found out. <laughs> or you poison the banker you're sleeping with for the insurance, marry a dozen men in a dozen little seaside towns. Margate, Torquay. Lord love them, but why must they stand so still? When I asked her who, who stood so still, she told me it was none of my beeswax and to be sure to be out of the house between midday and four as the char was coming and I would be underfoot and in the way. I've been in that B&B &B for three weeks now, looking for permanent digs. I paid in cash. The other guests were loveless folk on holiday and did not care if this was hove or hell. We'd eat our slippery eggs together. I'd watch them promenade if the day was fine or huddle under awnings if it rained. My landlady cared only that they were out of the house until tea time. A retired dentist from Edgebaston, down for a week of loneliness and drizzle by the sea, would nod at me over breakfast or if we passed on the seafront. The bathroom was down the hall. I was up in the night. I saw him in his dressing gown. I saw him knock upon her door. I saw it open. He went in. There's nothing more to tell. My landlady was there at breakfast, bright and cheery. She said the dentist had left early, owing to a death in the family. She told the truth. <laughs> that night the rain rattled the windows. A week passed and it was time. I told my landlady I'd found a place and would be moving on and paid the rent. That night she gave me a glass of whiskey and then another and said... I had always been her favourite and that she was a woman of needs. <laughs> a flower ripe for plucking. <laughs> and she smiled. And it was the whiskey made me nod and think she was perhaps a whit less sour of face and form. And so I knocked upon her door that night. She opened it. I remember the whiteness of her skin 
The whiteness of her gown, I can't forget. Mr. Maroney, she whispered. I reached for her, and that was forever that. The channel was cold and silt wet, and she filled my pockets with rocks to keep me under. So when they find me, if they find me, I could be anyone, crab-eaten flesh and sea-washed bones and all. I think I shall like it here in my new digs here on the seashore, and you have made me welcome. You've all made me feel so welcome. How many of us are there here? I see us, but I cannot count. We cluster on the beach and stare at the light in the uppermost room of her house. We see the curtains twitch. We see a white face glaring through the grime. She looks afraid, as if one loveless day we might start up the pebbles towards her to rebuke her for her lack of hospitality, to tear her for her bad breakfasts and her sour holidays and our fates. We stand so still. Why must we stand so still? It was end of last year, the very, very end of last year. Amanda and I got up to San Francisco about three o'clock in the afternoon, ran down to City Hall, got a marriage license. She did the Dresden Dolls gig. The following day, um, in the morning, she mentioned that she was going to have an exciting bachelorette party that night. <laughs> and did I want to come? And I said, I thought that kind of defeated the entire point of having an entire bachelorette party. And it was fine. I would have an exciting stag night on my own. <laughs> and Jason Webley, who was uh, a wonderful performer, the person who actually introduced us several years earlier. And at this point, the point who was going to be performing the ceremony the following day, said not to worry. He would... Uh, he would organize an evening of um, sushi, women, and song for me. <laughs> no, hang on, wine, women, and sushi. Yes, wine, women, and sushi for me. And I said, okay, rather nervously. And I found myself uh, initially taken out for a very nice sushi meal, and that was very sensible and strange. But usual, you know, it's, it's sushi, talking with Jason. Then he takes me off to a strange deserted spit of land as we watch a storm move in on San Francisco and we talk about stuff and we drink appalling wine. <laughs> and then he says, right, now women. And I think, oh dear, we're gonna, we're gonna ruin the, the magic of the evening. And I'm especially convinced we're gonna ruin the magic of the evening when he hands me a large wadge of tens and a large wadge of ones and says, you're gonna need these. <laughs> And it's not that I have anything at all against naked ladies dancing. I think naked ladies dancing is great, and all <laughs> naked ladies should dance a lot. Um, but, but I was going, no, it, it wasn't quite that kind of an evening. It was filled with strange magic. And then I found myself being led to somewhere that was definitely not a strip club. And there was a sign on the door letting me know that this was a brothel. Um, in fact, a parlor, it had a picture of a beautiful naked lady, but it was a, a parlor of ladies of a very special kind. <laughs> because each one, as I discovered, as I was sat down there and made a fuss of, was going to read me a poem. And did. And I came away and I thought I would write one for them. So this is called The Rhyme Maidens. The night before my wedding, I was taken to a castle. It was empty and abandoned, so I read the scrawled graffiti, words like truth and love and nowhere. We sat down on dampened concrete, where we talked about religion as the storm clouds took the city, and we drank the wine of weddings from a bottle that was painted with a skull. Mist and rain devoured the city, made the distant buildings vanish, 
So we walked back seeing no one, just two flames that danced together, which we guessed must be a woman. Then the rain came down like suicides. We ran like bolting rabbits, fled like men to a bordello where the password was 11. And she led us to her parlor, the madame. In the candle flickered parlor were 11 seated maidens, each as elegant as poetry, as beautiful as rhyme. One by one they'd sit beside me, unfold paper, read a poem. This one wants to be a cutthroat, that one warns me of bananas, whispered lust in lost iambics. Then I tuck eleven dollars in her hand. An accordion played salty songs. The mistress made us welcome, sang three songs of pain and sadness in her voice like rotten velvet as the rain came down like suicides or typewriters and songs on the night before my wedding. I was thinking of this poem and its need to be discovered like a child in a forest or a skull. In the end, the front door opened. My love read the final poem and she stared with wanton candor at the maidens of the rhyme as the rain tapped on the windows warned of change and transformations. Then the night before my wedding shook itself just like a raven, turned itself into a story, took us all into its shadow, and was done. While I'm trying to read things that are mostly uncollected, unknown, this is one of my favorite of my poems, and I'm reading it to you. It's called The Day the Sources Came. <laughs> that day, the sources landed. Hundreds of them, golden, silent, coming down from the sky like great snowflakes. And the people of Earth stood and stared as they descended, waiting dry-mouthed to find what waited inside for us, and none of us knowing if we would be here tomorrow. But you didn't notice it, because that day, the day the sources came, by some coincidence, was the day that the graves gave up their dead, and the zombies pushed up through soft earth or erupted, shambling and dull-eyed, unstoppable, came towards us, the living, and we screamed and ran. But you did not notice this, because on the saucer day, which was the zombie day, <laughs> it was Ragnarok also. <laughs> and the television screens showed us a ship built of dead men's nails, a serpent, a wolf, all bigger than the mind could hold, and the cameraman could not get far enough away, and then the gods came out. But you did not see them coming, because on the saucer zombie battling God's day, <laughs> the floodgates broke, and each of us was engulfed by genies and sprites, offering us wishes and wonders and eternities and charm and cleverness and true brave hearts and pots of gold, while giants FIFO fummed across the land and killer bees, but you had no idea of any of this. <laughs> because that day, the saucer day, the zombie day, the Ragnarok and fairies day, the day the great winds came and snows and the cities turned to crystal, the day all plants died, plastics dissolved, the day the computers turned, the screens telling us we would obey, the day angels drunk and muddled stumbled from a bars and all the bells of London were sounded, the day animals spoke to us in Assyrian, the Yeti day, the fluttering capes and arrival of the time machine day. You didn't notice any of this because you were sitting in your room, not doing anything, not even reading, not really, just looking at your telephone, wondering if I was going to call. <laughs> Amanda used to be, before ever she met me, a human statue. When she told me, an email, I think probably before we ever met, that she'd been a human statue. I sent her this short story. <laughs> and she still became my friend. 
It's called Feminine Endings. My darling, let us begin this letter, this prelude to an encounter, formally as a declaration in the old-fashioned way. I love you. You do not know me, although you have seen me, smiled at me, placed coins in the palm of my hand. I know you, although not so well as I would like. I want to be there when your eyes flutter open in the morning and you see me and you smile. Surely this would be paradise enough. So I do declare myself to you now with pen set to paper. I declare it again. I love you. I write this in English, your language, a language I also speak. My English is good. I was for many years ago in England and in Scotland. I spent a whole summer standing in Covent Garden, except for the month of Edinburgh Festival, when I am in Edinburgh. <laughs> People who put money in my box in Edinburgh included Mr. Kevin Spacey, the actor, and Mr. Jerry Springer, the American television star who was in Edinburgh for an opera about his life. <laughs> I have put off writing this for so long, although I have wanted to, although I have composed it many times in my head. Shall I write about you? About me? First you. I love your hair, long and red. The first time I saw you, I believed you to be a dancer, and I still believe that you have a dancer's body. The legs and the posture, head up and back, it was your smile that told me you were a foreigner before ever I heard you speak. In my country, we smile in bursts, like the sun coming out and illuminating the fields and then retreating again behind a cloud too soon. Smiles are valuable here, but you smiled all the time as if everything you saw delighted you. You smiled the first time you saw me, even wider than before. You smiled and I was lost like a small child in a great forest, never to find its way home again. I learned when young that the eyes give too much away. Some in my profession adopt dark spectacles or even, and these I scorn with bitter laughter as amateurs, masks that cover the whole face. What good is a mask? My solution is that of full sclera theatrical contact lenses, purchased from an American website for a little under 500 euro which cover the whole eye. <laughs> they are dark gray, of course, and look like stone. They have made me more than 500 euro, paid for themselves over and over. You may think, given my profession, that I must be poor, but you would be wrong. Indeed, I fancy that you will be surprised by how much I have collected. My needs have been small and my earnings always very good. Except when it rains. Sometimes even when it rains. The others, as perhaps you have observed, my love, retreat when it rains, raise umbrellas, run away. I remain where I am, always. I simply wait, unmoving. It all adds to the conviction of the performance. And it is a performance, as much as when I was a theatrical actor, a magician's assistant, even a dancer. That is how I am so familiar with the bodies of dancers. Always, I was aware of the audience as individuals. I have found this with all actors and all dancers, except the short-sighted ones for whom the audience is a blur. <laughs> My eyesight is good, even through contact lenses. Did you see the man with the mustache in the third row? We would say, he is staring at Minu with lustful glances. And Minu would reply, Ah, yes, but the woman on the aisle who looks like the German chancellor, she is now fighting to stay awake. <laughs> if one person falls asleep, you can lose the whole audience. So we play the rest of the evening to a middle-aged woman who wishes only to succumb to drowsiness. <laughs> the second time you stood near me, you were so close, I could smell your shampoo. It smelled like flowers and fruit. I imagine America as being a whole continent full of women who smell of flowers and fruit. <laughs> you were talking to a young man from the university. You were complaining about the difficulties of our language for an American. I understand what gives a man or a woman gender, you were saying, but what makes a chair masculine or a pigeon feminine? Why should a statue have a feminine ending? The young man laughed and pointed straight at me then. 
But truly, if you are walking through the square, you can tell nothing about me. The robes look like old marble, water-stained and time-worn, and lichened. The skin could be granite. Until I move, I am stone and old bronze, and I do not move if I do not want to. I simply stand. Some people wait in the square for much too long, even in the rain, to see what I will do. They are uncomfortable, not knowing, only happy once they have assured myself that I am natural, not artificial. It is the uncertainty that traps people, like mouse in a glue trap. I am writing about myself too much. I know that this is a letter of introduction as much as it is a, a love letter, but I should write about you, your smile, your eyes so green. You do not know the true color of my eyes. I will tell you, they are brown. <laughs> you like classical music, but you have also ABBA and Kid Loco on your iPod Nano. <laughs> you wear no perfume. Your underwear is for the most part faded and comfortable, although you have a single set of red lace bra and panties which you wear for special occasions. <laughs> People watch me in the square but the eye is only attracted by motion. I have perfected the tiny movement, so tiny that the passer can scarcely tell if it is something he saw or not. Yes, too often people will not see what does not move. The eyes see it, but do not see it. They discount it. I am human-shaped, but I'm not human. So in order to make them see me, to make them look at me, to stop their eyes from sliding off me and paying me no attention, I am forced to make the tiniest motions to draw their eyes to me. Then, and only then, do they see me. But they do not always know what they have seen. I see you as a code to be broken, or as a puzzle to be cracked, or as a jigsaw puzzle to be put together. I walk through your life, and I stand motionless at the edge of my own life. My own gestures, statuesque, precise, are too often misinterpreted. I love you. I do not doubt this. You have a younger sister. She has a MySpace account and a Facebook account. We talk sometimes. <laughs> All too often, people assume that a medieval statue exists only in the 15th century. This is not so true. I have a room, I have a laptop. My computer is passworded. I practice safe computing. <laughs> your password is your first name. That is not safe. Anyone could read your email, look at your photographs, reconstruct your interests from your web history. Someone who was interested and who cared could spend endless hours building up a complex schematic of your life, <laughs> matching the people in the photographs to the names in the emails, for example. It would not be hard reconstructing a life from a computer or from cell phone messages, like a crossword puzzle. I remember when I actually admitted to myself that you had taken to watching me, and only me, on your way across the square. You paused. You admired me. You saw me move once for a child, and you told a friend loud enough to be heard that I might be a real statue. I take it as the highest compliment. I have many different styles of movement, of course. I can move like clockwork in a set of tiny jerks and stutters. I can move like a robot or an automaton. I can move like a statue coming to life after hundreds of years of being stone. Within my hearing, you have spoken of the beauty of this small city, how standing inside the stained glass confection of the old church was like being imprisoned inside a kaleidoscope of jewels. It was like being in the heart of the sun. You were concerned about your mother's illness. When you were an undergraduate, you worked as a cook, and your fingertips are covered with the scar marks of a thousand tiny knife cuts. I love you, and it is my love for you that drives me to know all about you. The more I know, the closer I am to you. You were to come to my country with a young man, but he broke your heart, and you came here to spite him. And still you smiled. I close my eyes, and I can see you smiling. 
I close my eyes and I see you striding across the town square in a clatter of pigeons. The women of this country do not stride. They move diffidently, unless they are dancers. And when you sleep, your eyelashes flutter. <laughs> the way your cheek touches the pillow. The way you dream. I dream of dragons. When I was a small child at the home, they told me that there was a dragon beneath the old city. I pictured the dragon wreathing like black smoke beneath the buildings, inhabiting the cracks between the cellars, insubstantial and yet always present. That is how I think of the dragon and how I think of the past now, a black dragon made of smoke. When I perform, I have been eaten by the dragon and have become part of the past. I am truly 700 years old. Kings may come and kings may go. Armies arrive and are absorbed or return home again, leaving only damaged and bastard children behind them. But the statues remain and the dragon of smoke and the past. I say this, although the statue that I emulate is not from this town at all. It stands in front of a church in southern Italy where it is believed either to represent the sister of John the Baptist or a local lord who endowed the church to celebrate not dying of the plague or the angel of death. <laughs> I had imagined you perfectly chaste, my love. Yet one time the red lace panties were pushed to the bottom of your laundry hamper. And upon close examination, I was able to assure myself that you had unquestionably been unchaste the previous evening. <laughs> Only you know who with, for you did not talk of the incident in your letters home or allude to it in your online journal. <laughs> A small girl looked up at me once and turned to her mother and said, why is she so unhappy? I translate into English for you, obviously. The girl was referring to me as a statue, and thus she used the feminine ending. Why do you believe her to be unhappy? Why else would people make themselves into statues? Her mother smiled. Perhaps she is unhappy in love, she said. I was not unhappy in love. I was prepared to wait until everything was ready, something very different. There is time, there is always time. It is the gift I took from being a statue, one of the gifts, I should say. You have walked past me and looked at me and smiled, and you have walked past me and barely noticed me as anything other than an object. Truly, it is remarkable how little regard you or any human gives to something that remains completely motionless. You have woken in the night, got up, walked to the little toilet, peed and walked back to bed. You would not notice something perfectly still, would you? <laughs> something in the shadows. If I could, I would have made the paper for this letter for you out of my body. I thought about mixing in with the ink, my blood or spittle, but no. There is such a thing as overstatement. <laughs> yet great loves demand grand gestures, yet I am unused to grand gestures. I am more practiced in the tiny gestures. I made a small boy scream once simply by smiling at him when he had convinced himself that I was made of marble. It is the smallest gestures that will never be forgotten. I love you. Soon I hope you will know this for yourself and then we will never part. It will be time in a moment to turn around, put down the letter. I'm with you even now in these old apartments with the Iranian carpets on the walls. You've walked past me too many times. No more. I'm here with you. I am here now. When you put down this letter, when you turn and look across this old room, your eyes sweeping it with relief or with joy or even with terror, <laughs> then I will move, move just a fraction 
and finally you will see me. And this is called The Winter Gardens. The trees are filled with falling stars. The music won't outlast the night. I sit backstage and think of you. Sometimes we know when something's right. A voice is booming ships and ice, hands bow and fondle, bang and pluck. Small treasures keep this night alive. I smile a curve and bless my luck. There's magic, love, and what comes after. I know things now I never knew, such as I know when something's right and that my something right is you. I love her so much. <laughs> so, um... This is cool, I get to read something. <laughs> I read this today for the first time in ages at the Little Ninja gig, and it was so much fun, I thought I'd read it again. It's a true story um, about murder and, and saints. And the, the saints that I talk about in it, Saint Columba and Saint Oran, are real third, fourth century saints. And you're stuck now, you have to sit there and. I'm going to read the whole of this thing. I should have just asked you to tell a joke. <laughs> Can I do in Relic Oran? Yes. <laughs> you can catch your breath. Okay. When St. Columba landed on the island of Iona, his friend Oran landed with him. Though some say St. Oran waited in the shadows of the island, waiting for the saint to land there, I believe they came together, came from Ireland, were like brothers with a blonde and brave Columba, and the dark man they called Oran. He was Oran, like the otter was the other. There were others, and they landed on Iona, and they said, we'll build a chapel. It's what saints did when they landed. Oran, priest of sun or fire, or from Ora, meaning dark-haired. But their chapel kept on crumbling, and Columba took the answer from a dream or revelation that his building needed Oran needed death in the foundations. Others claim it was doctrinal, and Saints Oran and Columba were debating, as the Irish love debating, about heaven. Since the truth is long forgotten, we are left with just their actions. By their actions shall ye know them. Saint Columba buried Oran, still alive with earth about him, buried deep with earth upon him. Three days later, they returned there, Stocky monks with spades and mattocks. And they dug down to St. Oran so Columba could embrace him, touch his face and say his farewells. Three days dead, they brushed the mud off. When St. Oran's eyes blinked open, Oran grinned at St. Columba. He had died but now was risen and he said the words the dead know in a voice like wind and water. He said, heaven is not waiting for the good and pure and gentle, there's no punishment eternal, there's no hell for the ungodly, nor is God as you imagine. St. Columba shouted, quiet, and to save the monks from error, shoveled mud onto St. Oran. So they buried him forever, and they called the place St. Oran's. In its churchyard, kings of Scotland, kings of Norway, all were buried on the island of Iona. Some folk claim it was a druid priest of sunlight that was buried in the earth of good Iona just to hold the church foundations. But for me, that's much too simple. And it libels St. Columba, who cried, Earth, throw earth on Oran. Stop his mouth with mud this moment, lest he bring us to perdition. They imagine it a murder, as one saint entombed another underneath that holy chapel. While St. Oren's name continues, martyred heretic, his bones still hold the chapel stones together, and we join them, kings and princes, in his graveyard, in his chapel, for it's Oren's name they carry. He's embraced in his damnation by the simple words he uttered. There's no hell to spite the sinners. There's no heaven for the blessed. God is not what you imagine. And perhaps he kept on preaching, 
for he'd died and he had risen until silenced, crushed, or muffled by the soil of Iona. St. Columba, he was buried on the island of Iona decades later, but they disinterred his body and they took it to Downpatrick, where it's buried with St. Patrick and St. Bridget. So the only saint is Oren on the island of Iona. Don't go digging in that graveyard for the kings of old, the mighty, or archbishops and their riches. They are guarded by St. Oren, who will rise up from the grave dirt like the darkness, like an otter, for he sees the sun no longer. He will touch you, he will taste you, he will leave his words inside you. God is not what you imagine, nor is hell, and nor is heaven. Then you'll leave him and his graveyard, and forget the shadow's terror. As you rub your neck, remember only this, he died to save us, and that St. Columba killed him on the island of Iona. There were authors grumbling about not going to the Oscars. I heard about it from friends. So why are you going? They asked. I had written a book called Coraline, which director Henry Selleck had transformed into a stop-motion wonderland. I'd helped Henry as much as I could through the process of turning something from a book into a film. I had endorsed the film, encouraged people to see it, mugged with buttons on an internet trailer. I'd also written a 15-second sequence for the Oscars in which Coraline told an interviewer what winning an Oscar would do for her. I'd assumed that this would get me into the Oscars. It didn't. But Henry, as director, had tickets and could decide where they would go, and one of them went to me. My father had died on March the 7th, 2009. The Oscars are March the 7th, 2010. I expect that it would just be another day, and it will not bother me at all, demonstrating that I do not know myself very well, because when the day arrives, I am melancholy and do not want to go to the Oscars. I want to be at home, walking in the woods with my dog, and if I could simply press a button and be there without disappointing anybody, I would. I get dressed. A designer named Cambriel, whom I met when she had made a dress that would allow my fiancé and Jason Webley to represent conjoined twins, had offered to dress me for the Oscars, and I took her up on it. She made me a jacket and a waistcoat, and I fancy that I look pretty good in them. Best of all, now I have an answer to the people who ask, what are you wearing to the Oscars? And it makes Cambriel amazingly happy. Focus Films, who distributed Coraline, are looking after me. The previous night, they had a small reception at the Chateau Marmont for their two Oscar nominees, Coraline and a serious man. The partygoers were a strange mashup of Minneapolis Jews and animators. <laughs> Even more oddly, I was one of the Minneapolis Jews. <laughs> or almost, I wound up comparing notes with one of the other party goers on the St. Paul Papers pulse-pounding expose that I actually live an hour away from Minneapolis. The best thing about the Oscars I realized when the nominees were announced is that Coraline won't win. In the year that Up is nominated for Best Picture, which obviously it won't win, nothing but Up can win Best Animated Picture. A limo picks me up at 3 p.m. and we drive to the Oscars. It's a slow drive. Streets are closed off. The last civilians we see are standing on a street corner holding placards, telling me that God hates fags, that the recent earthquakes are God's special way of hating fags, <laughs> and that the Jews stole something, but I can't see what, as another placard is in the way. A block before we reach the Kodak Theatre, the car is searched, and then we're there and I'm tipped out onto the red carpet. Someone pushes a ticket into my hand to get the car back later that night. It's controlled chaos. I'm standing blankly, realising I have no idea what to do now, but the women look like butterflies and there are people in the bleachers who shout as each limo draws up. Someone says, Neil? <laughs> it's Diet from Focus. I just came back from walking Henry through. What a nice coincidence. Would you like me to take you through? I would like that very much. She asks if I would like to walk past the cameras, and I say that I would, because my fiancé is in Australia, and my daughters are watching on TV, and Cambriel will be happy to see her jacket on television. 
we head down into the throng behind someone in a beautiful dress. It looks like a watercolor of a dream. I have no idea who anyone is except for Steve Carell, because he looks just like Steve Carell on television, only a tiny bit less orange. <laughs> we are scrunched together tightly as we go through metal detectors, and the beautiful watercolor dress is trodden on. And the lady wearing it is very gracious about this. I ask Diet who's inside the dress, and she tells me it's Rachel McAdams. I want to say hello, Rachel said nice things about me in interviews, but she's working right now. I'm not. No one wants to take my photo, or as Diet discovers, to interview me. I'm invisible. At the bend in the red carpet, we pause. I look down at Rachel McAdams' watercolor dress and wonder if I can see a footprint. Cameras flash, but not at me. And we're into the Kodak Theater. Someone else introduces me to the editor of Variety. I realize my facial recognition skills do not work when people are in tuxedos. <laughs> Except for James Cameron, whom I have now only ever seen in a tuxedo and would not recognize wearing anything else. <laughs> I tell this to the editor of Variety. He points to a man with a tan and a huge grin, tells me it's the mayor of Los Angeles. He comes to all these things, he says. Why isn't he behind his desk working? Uh, because this is the biggest day in Hollywood's year, I venture, and it's Sunday. <laughs> well, yes, but he still comes out for the opening of a drinks cabinet. I went to the Golden Globes six weeks earlier and discovered that the commercial breaks in award shows are spent in a strange form of en masse Hollywood speed dating as people shuttle around the room trying to find friends or make deals and assume that tonight will be much the same. The Kodak Theater has a ground floor, and above that, three mezzanines. My ticket is for the first mezzanine. I head, sheep-like, up the stairs. There's a crush to get in as a disembodied voice tells us urgently that the Academy Awards will start in five minutes. I stare at the woman in front of me. She has blonde hair and a face that's strangely fish-like. A scary, sweet, plastic surgery face. She has old hands and a small, wrinkled husband who looks much older than her. I wonder if they started out the same age. <laughs> and we're in with no time to spare. The lights go down and Neil Patrick Harris sings a special Oscars tune. It does not seem to have a tune. Several people on Twitter who aren't sure which Neil is which congratulate me on it. <laughs> and now our hosts, Steve Martin and Alec Baldwin, they come out, they make jokes. From the first mezzanine, the timing is off, the jokes are awkward, the delivery is wooden. But it doesn't feel as if they're playing to us. I wonder if it works on television and send the question out on Twitter. A few hundred people tell me it's just as bad on TV. <laughs> 20 tell me they're enjoying it. I decide this is what Twitter is for, keeping you company when you're all alone on the mezzanine. <laughs> Best animated movie is the second category of the night. My 15 seconds of Coraline talking to the camera goes by fast. There, I think, the largest audience that my words will ever have. Up wins. The Oscars continue. In the audience, we cannot see what they're seeing on television at home. Somewhere below me, George Clooney is grimacing at the camera, but I do not know. Tina Fey and Robert Downey Jr. present the Best Screenplay Award and are funny. I wonder if they wrote their own bit. During the commercials, the lights go down and they play music to mingle by. Roxanne does not want to put on the red light. I head for the first mezzanine bar. I'm hungry and want to kill some time. I drink whiskey. I order a chocolate brownie, which turns out to be about as big as my head and the sweetest thing I've ever put in my mouth. <laughs> People are wandering up and down the stairs. Whiskey and sugar careening through my system. I defy the orders on my ticket not to photograph anything, and I Twitter a picture of the bar menu. My fiancé is sending me messages on Twitter urging me to photograph the inside of the women's toilet. <laughs> something she did during the Golden Globes, but even in my sugar-addled state, this seems a potentially disastrous idea. <laughs> Still, I think I should head downstairs and in the next commercial break, say hello to Henry Selleck. I walk over to the stairs. A nice young man in a suit asks me for my ticket. I show it to him. He explains that as a resident of the first mezzanine, I'm not permitted to walk downstairs and potentially bother the A-list. <laughs> I am outraged. I'm not actually outraged, but I'm a bit bored and have friends downstairs. 
I decide that I will persuade the inhabitants of the mezzanine to rise up as one and storm the stairs. Like in Titanic, they might shoot a few of us, I decide, but they cannot stop us all. We can be free, we can drink in the downstairs bar, we can mingle with Harvey Weinstein. Someone tells me on Twitter that nobody's checking the elevators. I suspect that this might be a trap and head back to my seat. Rachel McAdams presents an award in her beautiful oh so tread onable dress. For the Best Actor and Actress Awards, a tableau of people who've worked with the nominees tell us how wonderful they are. I wonder if this works on television. On the stage in front of us, it's painfully clumsy. People below us are milling and chatting and schmoozing more with every commercial break. There's an edge of panic to the disembodied announcer's voice as she orders them back to their seats. The man in the bar who reminded me of Sean Penn turns out to have been Sean Penn. <laughs> Jeff Bridges, standing ovation, reaches all the way to the top mezzanine. Sandra Bullock, standing ovation, only reaches the front rows of our level and stops there. Catherine Bigelow, standing ovation, covers the entire hall, except for some reason the top right of the first mezzanine where I am sitting, where we remain sitting and clap politely. It all seems to be building up to a crescendo. And then Tom Hanks walks out onto the stage and tells us with no build-up, if you exclude months of For Your Consideration campaigning, that, oh, by the way, the Hurt Locker won Best Picture, and good night, and we're out. Up two escalators to the governor's ball. I sit and chat to Michael Sheen, who brought his 11-year-old daughter, Lily, about the sushi dinner we had two days before, interrupted and ended by a police raid. We still have no idea why. Next morning, it will be a front-page story on the New York Times. They were serving illicit whale meat. I see Henry Selleck. He seems relieved that award season is over and that he can get on with his life. I feel as if I've sleepwalked invisibly through one of the most melancholy days of my life. There are glamorous parties that evening, but I don't go to any of them, preferring to sit in a hotel lobby with good friends. We talk about the Oscars. The next morning, the back page of the LA Times Oscar supplement is a huge panoramic photograph of the people on the red carpet. Somewhat to my surprise, I see myself standing front and center, staring down at Rachel McAdams' beautiful watercolor dress, <laughs> inspecting it for footprints. And I want to dedicate that one to everybody who is or was at Leica and who made Caroline. Thank you all. Somebody emailed me about uh, six months ago and asked if I could write something to be tattooed on their back. and saying they'd actually like a comic. And I wrote back and I said, who do you want to draw it? They said, David Mack, big David Mack fan. I thought, great. So I emailed David Mack and said, if I write something, would you like to draw it and we'll have it tattooed on this guy's back? <laughs> It'll be like a limited edition of one. <laughs> so he said, sure. And I thought, I will write a poem about the tattoo. As Amanda would say, very meta. <laughs> and this is called, I will write in words of fire. I will write in words of fire. I will write them on your skin. I will write about desire, write beginnings, write of sin. You're the book I love the best. Your skin only holds my truth. You will be our palimpsest, words of age, rewriting youth. You will not burn upon the pyre or be buried on a shelf. You're my letter to desire and you'll never read yourself. I will trace each word and comma as the final dusk descends. You're my tale, my dream, my drama. Let us find out how it ends. This is a story that I wrote called The Man 
who forgot Ray Bradbury. And I wrote it as a birthday present for Ray on his 91st birthday. It begins like this. I am forgetting things which scares me. I am losing words, although I'm not losing concepts. I hope that I'm not losing concepts. If I am losing concepts, I'm not aware of it. If I am losing concepts, how would I know? Which is funny, because my memory was always so good. Everything was in there. Sometimes my memory was so good that I even thought that I could remember things I didn't know yet. Remembering forward. I don't think there's a word for that, is there? Remembering things that haven't happened yet. I don't have that feeling I get when I go looking in my head for a word that isn't there, as if someone must have come and taken it in the night. When I was a young man, I lived in a big shared house. I was a student then. We had our own shelves in the kitchen, neatly marked with our names, and our own shelves in the fridge, upon which we kept our own eggs, cheese, yogurt, milk. I was always punctilious about using only my own provisions. Others were not so... Oh, there. I lost a word. Uh, one that would mean careful to obey the rules. The other people in the house were not so. I would go to the fridge, but my eggs would have vanished. I'm thinking of a sky filled with spaceships, so many of them that they seem like a plague of locusts, silver against the luminous mauve of the night. Things would go missing from my room back then as well. Boots. I remember my boots going, or being gone, I should say, as I did not ever actually catch them in the act of leaving. Boots do not just go. Somebody went them. <laughs> just like my big dictionary. Same house, same time period. I went to the small bookshelf beside my bed. Everything was by my bed. It was my room, but it was not much larger than a cupboard with a bed in it. I went to the shelf, and the dictionary was gone, just a dictionary-sized hole in my shelf to show where my dictionary wasn't. All the words in the book they came in were gone. Over the next month, they also took my radio, a can of shaving foam, a pad of notepaper, and a box of pencils, and my yogurt. <laughs> and I discovered, during a power cut, my candles. Now I'm thinking of a boy with new tennis shoes who believes he can run forever. No, that's not giving it to me a dry town in which it rained forever, a road through the desert on which good people see a mirage, a dinosaur that is a movie producer. The mirage was the pleasure dome of Kublai Khan. No. Sometimes, when the words go away, I can find them by creeping up on them from another direction. Say I go and look for a word, I'm discussing the inhabitants of the planet Mars, say, and I realize that the word for them has gone. I might also realize that the missing word occurs in a sentence or a title. The Chronicles. My favorite, if that does not give it to me, I circle the idea. Little green men, I think, or, or tall, dark-skinned, gentle. Dark they were and golden-eyed. And suddenly the word Martians is waiting for me, like a friend or a lover at the end of a long day. I left that house when my radio went. It was too wearing, the slow disappearance of the things I had thought so safely mine, item by item, thing by thing, object by object, word by word. When I was 12, I was told a story by an old man that I've never forgotten. A poor man found himself in a forest as night fell and he had no prayer book to say his evening prayers. So he said, God, who knows all things, I have no prayer book, and I do not know any prayers by heart, but you know all the prayers. You are God. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the alphabet, and I will let you put the words together. 
there are things missing from my mind and it scares me. Icarus. It's not as if I've forgotten all names. I remember Icarus. He flew too close to the sun. In the stories, though, it's worth it. Always worth it to have tried, even if you fail, even if you fall like a meteor forever. Better to have flamed in the darkness, to have inspired others, to have lived than to have sat in the darkness, cursing the people who borrowed but did not return your candle. <laughs> I have lost people, though. It's strange when it happens. I don't actually lose them. Not in the way one loses one's parents. Either as a small child, when you think you're holding your mother's hand in a crowd and then you look up and it's not your mother. Or later, when you have to find the words to describe them at a funeral service or a memorial, or when you're scattering ashes on a garden of flowers or into the sea. I sometimes imagine I would like my ashes to be scattered in a library. But then the librarians would just have to come in early the next morning to sweep them up again before the people got there. I would like my ashes scattered in a library or possibly a fun fair, a 1930s fun fair where you ride the black, the black, the, I've lost the word, carousel, roller coaster, the thing you ride and you become young again, the Ferris wheel, yes. There is another carnival that comes to town as well, bringing evil by the pricking of my thumbs. Shakespeare. I remember Shakespeare, and I remember his name, and who he was, and what he wrote. He's safe for now. Perhaps there are people who forget Shakespeare. They would have to talk about the man who wrote to be or not to be. No, not the film starring Jack Benny, whose real name was Benjamin Kubelski, who was raised in Waukegan, Illinois, an hour or so outside Chicago. Waukegan, Illinois was later immortalized as Greentown, Illinois, in a series of stories and books by an American author who left Waukegan and went to live in Los Angeles. I mean, of course, the man I'm thinking of. <laughs> I can see him in my head when I close my eyes. I used to look at his photographs on the back of the books. He looked mild, and he looked wise, and he looked kind. He wrote a story about Poe to stop Poe being forgotten, about a future where they burn books and they forget them. And in the story, we are on Mars, although we might as well be in Waukegan or Los Angeles, as critics, as those who would repress or forget books, as those who would take the words, all the words, dictionaries and radios full of words, as those people are walked through a house and murdered one by one by orangutan, by pit and pendulum, for the love of God, Montressa. Poe. I know Poe and Montressa, and Benjamin Kabelski, and his wife, Sadie Marx, who was no relation to the Marx brothers and who performed as Mary Livingston. All these names in my head. I was 12. I'd read the books, I'd seen the film, and the burning point of paper was the moment where I knew that I would have to remember this because people would have to remember books if other people burn them or forget them. We will commit them to memory. We will become them. We become authors. We become their books. I'm sorry. I, I lost something there. Like a path I was walking that dead ended and now I'm alone and lost in the forest and I'm here and I do not know where here is anymore. You must learn a Shakespeare play. I will think of you as Titus Andronicus. Or you, my friend, you could learn an Agatha Christie novel. You will be Murder on the Orient Express. Someone else could learn the poems of John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester. And, and you, whoever you are listening to this, you can learn a Dickens book. And when I want to know what happened to Barnaby Rudge, I will come to you. You can tell me. And the people who would burn the words, the people who would take the books from the shelves, the firemen and the ignorant, the ones afraid of tales and words and dreams and Halloween and people who have tattooed themselves with stories. And boys, you can grow mushrooms in your cellar and as long as your words, which are people, which are days, which are my life, as long as your words survive, then you lived and you mattered and you changed the world and I cannot remember your name. I learned your books, burned them into my mind in case the firemen came to town but who you are is gone. I wait for it to return to me, just as I waited for my dictionary or for my radio or for my boots, and with just as meager a result. All I have left is the space in my mind where you used to be, 
and I'm not so certain about even that. I was talking to a friend, and I said, are these stories familiar to you? I told him all the words I knew, the ones about the monsters coming home to the house with the human child in it, the ones about the lightning salesman and the wicked carnival that followed him, and the Martians and their fallen glass cities and their perfect canals. I told him all the words, and he said he hadn't heard of them, that they didn't exist. And I worry. I worry I was keeping them alive. Like the people in the snow at the end of the story, walking backwards and forwards, remembering, repeating the words of the stories, making them real. I think it's God's fault. I mean, he can't be expected to remember everything. God can't. Busy chap. <laughs> so perhaps he delegates things sometimes, just goes, you, I want you to remember the dates of the Hundred Years' War. And you... You remember a copy. You, you remember Jack Benny, who was Benjamin Kabelski from Waukegan, Illinois. And then, when you forget the thing that God has charged you with remembering, bam, no more a copy. Just in a copy shaped hole in the world, which is halfway between an antelope and a giraffe. No more Jack Benny. No more Waukegan. Just a hole in your mind where a person or a concept used to be. I don't know. I don't know where to look. Have I lost an author, just as once I lost a dictionary? Or worse, did God give me this one small task and now I have failed him and because I have forgotten him, he has gone from the shelves, gone from the reference works and now he only exists in our dreams. My dreams. I do not know your dreams. Perhaps you do not dream of a veldt that is only wallpaper but that eats two children. Perhaps you do not know that Mars is heaven, where our beloved dead go to wait for us, then consume us in the night. You do not dream of a man arrested for the crime of being a pedestrian. I dream these things. If he existed, then I've lost him. Lost his name, lost his book titles, one by one by one. Lost the stories. And I fear that I'm going mad, for I cannot just be growing old. If I have failed in this one task, oh God, then only let me do this thing that you may give the stories back to the world. Because perhaps if this works, they will remember him. All of them will remember him. His name will once more become synonymous with small American towns at Halloween when the leaves skitter across the sidewalk like frightened birds, or with Mars, or with love, and my name will be forgotten. I'm willing to pay that price if the empty space in the bookshelf of my mind can be filled again before I go. Dear God, hear my prayer. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Today, I intended to begin to write. Stories are waiting like distant thunderstorms, grumbling and flickering on the grey horizon. And there are emails and introductions and a book, a whole damn book about a country and a journey and belief I'm here to write. I made a chair. <laughs> I opened a cardboard box with a blade. I assembled the blade, removed the parts, carried them carefully upstairs. Functional seating for today's workplace. I pressed five casters into the base, learned that they press in with the most satisfying pop, attached the armrests with the screws puzzling over the left and the right of it and the screws not being what they should be as described in the instructions, <laughs> and then the base beneath the seat attached with six 40 millimeter screws that were puzzlingly six 45 millimeter screws. <laughs> Then the headpiece to the chair back, the chair back to the seat, which is where the problems start as the middle screw on either side declines to penetrate and thread. This all takes time. 
Orson Welles is Harry Lyme on the old radio as I assemble my chair. Orson meets a dame and a crooked fortune teller and a fat man and a New York gang boss in exile and has slept with the dame, solved the mystery, read the script and pocketed the money before I have assembled my chair. <laughs> making a book is a little like making a chair. Perhaps it ought to come with warnings, like the chair instructions. A folded piece of paper slipped into each copy. Warning, only for one person at a time. <laughs> Do not use as a stool or stepladder. <laughs> Failure to follow these warnings can result in serious injury. <laughs> one day I will write a book, and when I am done, I will climb it like a stool or a stepladder, or like a high old wooden ladder propped against the side of a plum tree in the autumn, and I will be gone. But for now, I shall follow these warnings and finish making a chair. A hundred words to talk of death, at once too much and not enough. My plans beyond that final breath are currently a little rough. The dying thing comes on so slow. Reluctance to get out of bed is magnified each day and so transmuted into dead. I dream of dying all alone. Nobody there to watch me pass. Nothing remains for me to own. No breath remains to fog the glass. And when I do put down my pen, my memories will fly like birds. When I am done, when I am dead and finished with my hundred words. <laughs>